Welcome everyone to Flip Learning 3.0. This session is number six in a series about the new era of flipped learning. Thank you all for being with us today. I want to remind you that this is a 30-minute session and today's topic, how flipped learning takes mastery learning from good to great. With us today is Lisa McCauley. Lisa is a middle school math teacher who's been running a flipped mastery class for five years. Lisa is an FLGI Global Flipped Learning Ambassador and has achieved flip learning certification level one. She is also a Google level one and level two certified educator and is passionate about spreading flip learning in her district. Also joining us is Lori Johnson. Lori has been a middle school science teacher for 12 years. She's the first science teacher in her district to move to flip learning. Lori has also achieved flip learning certification level one as part of her passion and commitment to keep learning. Your moderator today, as usual, is John Bergman, and uh, the presentation will take about 15 minutes, after which we'll take your questions. To ask a question, you'll need to click the Q&A button on the upper right-hand corner of your screen, and then type your questions into the text box. I will read your questions out loud and direct them to our panelists for reply. So I think that does it. Let's get started. John, over to you. Well, it's exciting to be with everybody again. Uh, Flip Learning 3.0, Flipped Mastery. We have some amazing panelists today. Very excited for what is ahead. First of all, quick thank you to Cisco. Cisco provides the backbones to make this work. They're a great technology mission partner of the Flipped Learning Global Initiative. And speaking of the Flipped Learning Global Initiative, we have some other uh, companies that we are uh, partnering with. These are amazing companies. We recommend their products. Uh, to the session now, as you probably know, in Flip Learning 3.0, there are five key tenets. Flip Learning is not static. It's evolving because of three factors emerging as a global movement. There is a new awareness emerging and has created new opportunities. Today, we're going to focus on number two. Flip Learning is evolving because of three factors. Those three factors, as it turns out, are research, classroom innovation, and technology. Today's session is going to focus on the classroom innovation piece so we want to welcome the amazing Lisa and the amazing Lori, a couple of uh, teachers. And let me just, as an anecdote, I spent some time in their classrooms and was blown away by what I saw. So we are in for a treat, people. So Lisa and Lori, take it away. Okay, hi. Um, I'm Lisa McCauley, and um, I teach sixth grade math at Viking Middle School in Gurney and have been doing flipped mastery in my classroom for um, almost five years now. I'm Lori Johnson. I teach at Viking Middle School as well. I teach uh, science, and I have been doing flip mastery for three years. Um, so basically, what is flipped mastery learning? Um, we were, um, I guess you could say fortunate in that we actually, we, we kind of went a non-traditional route and never did traditional flip. We went straight to flipped mastery, and that's basically because of the demographics in our district. Uh, we, we unfortunately cannot rely on our students to go home every night and watch a video and come to class prepared. We need to give them class time to do their work. So what, it, what do we think flip, flip Mastery Learning is? Basically, it's where kids can learn anytime, anywhere. That might be at their house. It might be in our classrooms. It could be in our library space. It could be at McDonald's after school, whatever. They can do their learning anytime. Um, uh, both of our classrooms are completely student-directed learning. Everything is in their hands. Um, it's fully self-paced, um, and we require them to master their standards or concepts through the use of assessment and remediation before we allow them to move on. And we do that through our self-directed curriculum. Um, it's a self-directed learning experience for all students, and it can be achieved in any subject. And to hop onto that about any subject, um, all four of our core contents on our team, so social studies, science, math, and language arts, all four of us are teaching flip mastery. Um, there, it's rare to see that all um, classes can do that. Unfortunately, today, the only, only two of our, our members of our team were able to join us for this session, but our social studies and our language arts teachers um, also do flip mastery as well. Now, now ladies, I gotta interject, this seems crazy. You mean that you've got sixth grade students who are moving through the content at a flexible pace, self-paced, yes. and it works. Yes, it works great. Absolutely. <laughs> but but that we're... means kids are at different places in the content. You're not they're not all learning the same thing at the same time on the same day. That that's gotta be a logistical nightmare. 
not mm. necessarily. Yeah. It's, it's not always easy to start, but once you get organized and find a method, which we'll, we'll be going through a little bit later on, um, once you get yourself organized and find a method that works for you, it really is not as difficult as it seems. Yeah, well, of course, I'm being facetious. So, folks, what we're going to do now is going to turn it over to you. We've got a question for you to respond to. So, if you could hop onto a browser, and uh, I hope you can see this, is if I can see it. So ask this question: What concerns or fears do you have with implementing Flip Mastery? So, you go to this place, Minty.com, and use the code 415341, and uh, your responses will appear. I'm going to do it myself. We're going to do two of these, by the way. And as we do these two, um, you'll have, um, and this is going to like turn into a word cloud. So, oh, there's some interesting ones. Time, pacing, and just fear. This is an honest person. Okay. Okay. Oh, chaos. Ooh, that's an awesome response. That's voice. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Other other thoughts? Yeah, yeah. All right. Any more people to respond? Maybe they're having a hard time getting into the, into the tool. All right. We're going to cut you off in a minute here because we want to hear how they deal with the chaos. Okay, all right, I think we'll just jump away. So, so tell us some more about um, uh, the, the techniques. Walk us through this, guys. You, you, there's one slide be behind that, or in front of that. Should have had. There should be one more in there. Why? That, there we go, how, the how. No, They're in different how. Ways. Okay, there you go. No. Okay, first, first can, I, can I jump in to mention something about the chaos there that was mentioned? Yeah, yeah. I've always control, uh, uh, called my classroom a, a controlled chaos environment to begin with anyway, um, so as long as you can find that organization. So the how to um, manage kids at different levels. So one of the things that we do is we put them in concept groups. So each of um, the groups, Wherever they are, we have different pods or we have different areas with throughout the room where the groups are um, set up. So students, as they finish a concept, they move to the next concept. We have different areas that are labeled throughout the rooms that can show where the kids are and so that those groups can work in pods together and um, assist each other as needed. So that's one way to help control some of the chaos there. We also use um, student leaders. So um, in the science classroom in particular, I have um, multiple science labs set up during any unit. So I could have anywhere from two labs to seven labs going at any given time, um, which can be very intimidating. Um, but you have, I have TAs. So students that are two or more concepts ahead of another student um, or a group of students, they become the TA as long as they have passed that group or that concept with mastery then they act as the TA for me in that classroom and they assist those students that are going through those other labs. So it adds another person, another me in a way, to that environment where they can help lead those students to more success um, until I can be available whenever that time may, may um, turn out. Um, the third thing that's listed here is the pacing calendars. So Lisa and I both have um, a couple different ways that we manage this. I use an app that's called iDocio. Um, which is, can we move forward to the slide to show and explain that as we go? Is that, okay, there's the iDocu, thank you. Um, so this has all the different concepts groups lined up, so those are all the different concepts as we move through them, and you can set this up in any way that you want in terms of what you want to get out of it. I do check marks or I'll put numbers there for whether they got a one, two, three, four, or five based on the standard concepts. Um, but this is my tracking system so that if students come into the room each day, I know where each student is at each concept, where they should be um, stationed throughout the room, and where they should be headed for that day, what their um, ideas are planned. So let's back up. How many stations have you got? Talk, talk about these stations. Well, so I have different stations for the labs, 
throughout the room, so this is for science. So for science in the room, um, there are different areas in the back of the room set up for the lab. So I have, um, um, they're, they're um, what are those called? Clipboards. Clipboards, thank you, sorry. Um, there's clipboards throughout the room that have what each of the labs are. And so the kids are at each of those stations once they've passed the concept. So um, in my particular units, I have an engagement piece, then I have um, a piece where they do some reading and some writing and instructional time, then they watch a video, and then they do the lab concept, and that kind of is the culmination of putting it all together. So once they get to that station, um, that's where the lab is and, and the kind of the final questions some maybe um, in the past may have used like exit slips um, to find out what they really truly understood for that whole concept. So I have different areas in the back of the room um, that the kids will go to for those different labs. And then for math, um, I um, am kind of a control freak and I like things very organized and non-chaotic. So when you mention chaos, it's a little bit ironic because my class, I would say, was much more chaotic when I was a whole class instructor because I, um, I didn't feel my classroom management was that great. Using this mastery model, my class is oftentimes very quiet. Um, most of the students Adam, are learning. Sorry gym. about that. Adam, We're, go to the gym. We are in our school STEM lab right now. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, um, I have kids sit in concept groups and then I have a help chain of command where the students know that um, before coming to me for help, they run through their chain of command and that would first be to read their directions, look at their Google Sheet. Um, if you could pop back one slide for me, John. So, so I use a Google Sheet to track progress for students and I, I do this for a couple of reasons. The main reason is because I like it to be shared with the students and actually I share with parents too if they want so that there's never any miscommunication between myself and the student on what I'm expecting them to accomplish each day. And so they have a very specific task or two to do each day. Um, they work within their concept groups, going to their directions and then to their peers within their concept group is their next step for help, and then if that's not good enough, they go to the people that are in the concepts ahead of them because they've clearly mastered them before, and then if that's not working, then they come to me and I help them resolve the problem. So it's actually not very chaotic at all in my classroom, um, much less chaotic than it ever used to be. How do you determine um, where a student should do something? They're going to be doing different things on different days, mm -hmm. but how do you know when student A needs to be doing you know, X and student B needs to do Y by looking at this chart? Um, well, I use the Google Sheet to communicate what it is I want them to do, and then they turn it in in a variety of ways. Like, um, for example, um, I, all of my material is pushed out to the students through iTunes U, and it's in a course for them. It's all set up for them to follow. And, like, for example, after they watch a video where I would give them the lesson instruction, they do a Google Form note check, and I check it to see that they did understand the video. And if they did, I tell them, great, move on to the next step, which is oftentimes practice. And they have a very like linear process to go through to complete a step. And their final step would be um, kind of a show off step where they have to show their mastery to me in, in any way that they would like. And then lastly, they set up an interview with me. So they'll schedule a verbal interview where I sit down, verbally interview them. And then it's just me filling out this Google sheet each day, which tells them what it is they should work on. And, and they come in and they, I use signs in my classroom to indicate the concept groups and that's where they sit. Uh, yeah. so, so back up, Lisa, I think, so I'm a student in your class and I've got a box that says, like right here, we got student one. You type in that box, and it's communication to Johnny, me, yep. John, saying Map Monday, do 5:30. That hot pro that's that's my instructions because you yep. looked at the end of the day saying, little Johnny, this is what you need to be doing tomorrow, right? Yes, exactly. So each day, part of my process is I evaluate what they did the current day, and then I fill out what they need to do the next day. And I use a color coding system. You can see, I yeah. use yellow indicates that I checked in with them that day and that they had everything done that they were supposed to do. Pink indicates that they maybe didn't have their work done, and um, you know I have, there's various like rewards and consequences in my classroom for you know to incentivize them to do their work on time. But yeah. that's kind of how I manage it. You get this whole communication system just built into Google Sheets. 
Yes, it's a, it's my it, it drives my entire classroom. And then if if parents, I, I used it with parents a lot last year. If parents were kind of confused by self paced and they they their kids would go home and say, well, I don't have any homework because I did it all in class, and the parents would be a little unsure about that. And I said, well, you can always check the Google sheet. And if it's if the box is empty and colored in yellow, they're good. They did all their work and they don't have any homework. But if there's still something written in there, I haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Laura, you do things a little differently when you look at this. You you found some kind of a, a you know a commercial product that kind of handles this for you. But right. how, how do I know if I'm little Johnny, I'm in your class? How do I know what I'm supposed to do tomorrow? I I meet with them every single day. So every single student I touch base with every single day. Um, typically at the start of each class, I give you know a quick two minute blurb about you know whatever and and there's information that's on the you know board for them or in my Google Classroom of what they need to get started on. So it'll, it'll might have a due date, like the due date of um, Matter Lab 4, it closes on Thursday. So, you know, if you don't have it done by Thursday, then you need to see me for different information. So I do a whole class kind of information thing, and then I meet with each student individually. And so on this iDocio form, each of the different um, concepts that are within iTunes U, because I use iTunes U as well, um, are set up there. So the orange, then the light green, the, the darker green, and the um, are all different concepts that they need to complete. So I meet with them and I tell them what step they're actually on, what step they need to have completed, and by what due date. So like I'm looking down in the middle, there's a, there's a, I don't know, I see a three. I could go walk that row. I, that's, I assume that's one student. Correct. And that student has mastered up to, and there's a big red X. So I'm guessing that Chapter 4 Launch Lab is not done and not been mastered by that student. That is correct. Yeah, yeah. And I do have due dates with them because with self-paced, if you give some students, you know, an, enough time, they're going to take all the time in the world. So I might have, you know, I have to get through physics and chemistry and astronomy. And if we start with physics, I might have students that are still in physics at the end of the year if we don't set a pacing calendar. So we also use pacing calendars in order to provide them with a time frame. So we have specific time frames that they have to complete different activities within the concept, as well as for me specifically with each lab. So right. the, the X's are students that didn't finish those. Now I'll have I have lunchtime recess available if they want to come and see me, and, and we are, actually have sixth grade. Um, most of our students have a study hall for 15 to 20 minutes at the end of each day. They're also allowed to come and see me at that time, and they can go back and complete those. X's to fulfill that complete standard. But if they don't, then they don't pass that standard. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we got an image here. Uh, can you explain what's going on here? I think these are pretty cool, powerful images. Yeah, this is what um, our classes look like, basically. The one on the left is an image, actually, of Lori's class, but I kind of made it look like my class because I didn't have time to take a picture before the end of the year. But the signs, I hang signs that's from the ceiling, and you can see examples of my signs. Those are the concept groups, like one of them says factor and expand linear expressions. One is adding, subtracting decimals. Each concept has a QR code associated with it. Those are um, what I call hot problems or higher order thinking problems. Those are one of their culminating activities that they do when they've completed the concept. It's a chance to earn bonus points. Um, and then the image on the right, I'll let Lori explain that that's her science lab. So uh, similar to Lisa, I have you know set up, I have the clipboards there. And so I have whatever it is, and then the, the concept is the physical and chemical properties, the standards listed below that. And those are situated throughout the room, so where the students are sitting, those would all be different lab sections. Um, and so it's clearly marked where they need to go so um, they understand what, um, where they need to be. I gotta say, I love the design too. That's an old like book bookshelf thing yeah. taped to a clipboard. <laughs> awesome, I love the hat. It's awesome. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, tell us more. How do you manage the workload from your teacher? This feels like overwhelming. I'm guessing teachers, um, this feels like, this seems like a lot of work. It, and, and that is probably the biggest um, issue that teachers would say and the, the, the teachers that aren't, haven't started at our school, that's what we typically hear. And I mean, all I can say is that, yes, it, it is a lot of work to, to get it to the point where it is in our classrooms right now. But you don't have to be perfect from the start. Mm -hmm. You just start small and build, and it, it becomes, it makes your life so much easier once it is kind of established. 
um, I'm very lucky. I have um, a co-teacher that I can partner with where the other math teacher for sixth grade, we do everything together. So we build all the units together. We tweak them together, make changes to videos. We keep a, like a Google Doc with changes that we want to make, and we basically just each attack the list when we have time. Um, and I, I'm not as lucky. Um, I have a teacher who she's retiring um, the year after next, and just, you know, she wants to do her own thing, and that's fine. But I, I really loved this concept, especially when I saw what Lisa was doing in her classroom, and I just jumped in. So I started without doing the lab. So it was semi-self-paced, and I started with, um, you know, just doing the basic concepts. And I couldn't figure out for the life of me, how am I going to do these labs, you know, with a self-paced environment? And I just, I just went for it. I just started doing it. Um, no one else in my building or my district um, for science was doing it. But I'll tell you what, it's the best thing I've ever done. My students with, in the lab environment have more time with me and I have more time with them to build the relationship, to answer their questions, to make sure they're truly understanding each of those labs and what they mean than I have ever had before. Um, so, you know, it, for me, it was not all in at once. It was, let's try this and then let's try that. And both of us were continuously updating, changing, you know, every summer on my list is let's change this unit again and make it better. Um, make new, new videos, find new videos, keep it fresh for the students and, um, up to date. And that's one of the best things. It's not like a textbook that you, you know, is outdated. You've got something new all the time. You know, folks, if you think flipped classroom is a great idea, I can't, I, I'm going to echo what these, uh, Lisa and Lori have said, is that uh, flipped mastery makes it look boring. Um, when we, you know, I guess invented flipped mastery after we'd done flipped classroom for a year, we realized that flipped mastery was so much better than the flipped classroom. Our students moved their pace. And yes, like, like uh, Lori, we did it in a science classroom. Uh, best thing we ever did. So we want to turn this over to you now. Um, you probably got a question or 10 and we'd like to hear what those questions are. So I think Errol's been monitoring the question. I think there's a place you have to put it, and I, I missed the text, something on the... Errol, you want to jump in and tell them where to put the question? That is correct. If you have a question, now is the time to pose it. Just go to the upper right-hand corner of your screen. You'll see a little button with a Q&A and a question mark. Tap that button, type in your question. Make sure you address it to all panelists so we can ensure that everyone gets it. And uh, once we get your question, I will repeat it, and uh, then we'll get your question answered. With that, let's go and take one. We have a question already from Jim. He says, so is all this teaching done online? Let's go to you, Lisa. Um, yeah, is the teaching done online? Yes. Um, well, all of it? I can speak for math um, in that all of my instruction is done via video. It is me or the other math teacher now doing the instruction. It used to be, um, we used to get videos from other places and then we gradually replaced them. We do feel like it's important that it's us doing the teaching, but yeah, it is all online. Um, and I just want to give a quick little plug. I'm actually tutoring a student this summer, a student that I had last year, um, and he, we're actually just finishing what he didn't finish last year. He is um, going through the self-paced lessons, and he told me, I tutored him last night actually, and he said, this is why live lessons would never work for me. People talk too fast and write too fast. I like to be able to pause, and it was just awesome. It just gave me um, validation. Let me, let me clarify. I'm not sure I would say that you're doing everything online. You are doing your direct instruction online. Yeah. The real power of this model is what you get to do face to face five days a week with your students. Absolutely. Helping them, monitoring them, pushing them, experimenting, inquiring, testing. Yeah. Right. Everything in the classroom is done face to face then. I do all the help with them and all the work that they do, the daily work we do together. Right. And certainly any of the remediations or the assessments or conversations that we have, those those are face to face and that's one of again, like you said, John, one of the benefits to flip mastery is that you're working one on one, you build those relationships more so than you would in a direct instruction environment. You just said something, you said this a couple of times. I think it was Lori, maybe both of you said this, about relationships. Mm -hmm. Can you compare your life before flipped to after flipped in terms of the the quality of the relationships you have with your students? I'll tell you this, and I'm I'm a little embarrassed to admit this, but prior to flipping, I did not know all of my students um, as 
as well, as thoroughly. So I might know a little bit something about that, but I have come to learn more about their personal lives or their conversations or what's going on at home or, or what their concerns are in terms of an emotional, social environment because you, you're, we're, we're touching each of those kids, so to speak, each single day. So previously when we're in all, I'm standing up in front of the kids and just saying something to all of them, now I'm going to each one of those students most days, if not every day, and having a conversation with them. Of course, it's related to science or math or whatever the content is, but because we're able to um, integrate with them on a one-to-one -one level, it really has changed, I think, our, the relationship as a whole, how they see school, how they see teachers. I think that that's really made a huge difference. And I had, um, I, every year now, I've had students um, tell me at the end of the year, and I had one in particular this year, that um, wrote me a letter and said how I completely changed her perspective on math and that made it to the where they could actually understand it and enjoy it. And just that, that stuff is what really touches me. Cool. We have a number of questions, so let's try to get some in. The next question is, oh, wait a minute. Another one came in just now. Let's go back here. Would you please give some examples of the rewards and consequences to ensure that students meet their objectives? Lori? Okay, so there's several several different things. Um, although rewards are important, we try and look more at the natural consequences that happen. So in our particular setting, um, we take recess and um, each of us on our team takes a, a, a day of recess where students who are not completed with the concept or with the steps that they're supposed to complete. So Lisa typically says two steps a day needs to be done. Now, if they don't finish in class, they can finish at home, but a lot of our students are not um, set up for that at home, whether it's lack of Wi-Fi or lack of support. Um, so they need to come in and stay with us at recess, and then if we don't, there's further consequences in terms of like uh, minors or majors in terms of um, further disciplinary action in that terms. Of course, conversations and communication with parents home um, is another consequence. They're not allowed to go on field trips if they're missing too many of their concepts. So there's a whole lot of things that we have built in within our team that um, encourages them to stay on top of the work. And it's done 90, I'd say what, 95% of it is done within our classroom or, or should be able to be done within our classroom. So there shouldn't really be an excuse if they're being productive. We have quite a few lined up, so let's try to get as many as we can. Uh, how, would implement, how would implementation work for an intensive reading class? John? Yeah, um, Flip Mastery has been working in virtually every subject matter. Um, you know, I, some of you may know that I've written a number of books on Flip Classroom, and we've got a book on Flip Science, Flip uh, English, Social Studies, uh, and uh, Elementary, and Math, whatever. There's five in that series, and we talk about mastering each of them, and there are examples of reading teachers who've done some good stuff. In fact, one good example, frankly, is what's happening with you guys, with your English teacher and your team, right? I, I, I actually highlighted her and the work that she's done, and so, uh, you know, she, she took things like, uh, the example that we used in the book was uh, she took the concept of short stories, broke it down into very specific, specific discrete to topics like protagonist, um, you know, antagonist, I don't know, all the different things, teaching them sort of the, the parts of the things they look for in a short story, and then the students had to demonstrate mastery in some way. Um, I forget all the details, but it certainly can be done. And it is being done, not just can, it's being done. Got it, very good. We go to the next one. How do you assess mastery, and what do you do for students who need remediation, Lisa? Um, okay, I assess mastery in a lot of different ways. Um, I call it a show-off step. And when a student finishes a concept, they have to show me or prove to me that they know the concept. I do allow them like 100% free choice in how to do that. I will give them suggestions if they want, but I also have U2s where they can do whatever they like. So some kids make videos, some kids make posters. I've had kids make little art projects. Um, some choose to just do a worksheet. In some way, though, they have to show me um, that they've mastered the concept. I do have a rubric that, that goes along with it to grade them as to how they're going to be graded on the standard. And then, um, as I mentioned earlier, I do do a final verbal interview with every student, um, just me, them, and a whiteboard so that they can really prove that they, they do get it. Lori, have you experienced any pushback from students, parents, or admins? And so, how do you handle it? You know, surprisingly, it's been limited. 
Um, our admin, not at all. They are all over this. They, they are trying to get us to encourage more people in our building to um, do similar things, especially since we're the only ones doing it as a full team. Um, there's a few parents, but what happens in the end is it's the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. You know, when they see that their student, students, their children, are actually learning the concept, mastering the concept, and being able to show their understanding of the concept, whether that's language arts, social studies, science, or math, um, they really don't have anything to say. And we've had parents who have actually come back and, and have said, you know, I was wrong. <laughs> Got it. Lisa, do you think flip mastery would be feasible in big classes, like around 30 pupils per class, like here in Italy? I mean, I do. I mean, I, I personally find it easier than whole class instruction. Um, I, I think you just need to have some sort of an organizational structure. I mean, something like how I've got the Google sheet where or something that's going to communicate to the kids so in, especially with a big class if you were limited in time and couldn't get to every student each day I would encourage you to have some kind of a document or something like that that's shared with them so the expectations are never lost that's one piece that I found very very helpful and I have I'll jump in on that too um, I did this with 33 and 34 students in my classes 10 years ago that's or right. actually eight years ago so um, yes can in a, in a science classroom yeah, we, we've had it up to 30, I've had up to 32 students with this format, and it actually runs even better with this format than it did in the labs when I had, you know, eight different lab groups running. Um, I may have seven different labs, but it's surprisingly different. Yeah. We've got too many questions here, but we are out of time, so we'll slip in one last one. John, what about ideas for working with adults? Well, this is actually this idea of, comp you know, another people call this flipped mastery model the competency-based learning. And so you look in, um, you know, the corporate world and you want people to learn specific competencies. Um, in fact, if people care, we're writing a book on flipped corporate training as, as we speak, Errol and I, who's on the line here. And what we've been discovering is that a lot of, of, of industry is interested in competence. You know, um, uh, I know somebody who's in the nuclear power industry and they want somebody to actually know <laughs> Duh, right? Know how to operate the nuclear power plant. They have to actually have mastered the concept. And so, uh, competency learning in adults is 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 an important important thing because we're not going to give you the controls of the nuclear power plant if you don't know how to use it. So, uh, this same idea, it, it's going to look a little different, um, and we don't have time to discuss, you know, how it's going to look different in an andragogical as opposed to a pedagogical environment. But it definitely um, is taking off there. Another day, another time. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Lisa and Lori, for sharing your experience, strategies, and tools. In the coming weeks, we'll be bringing you Flip Learning innovators from around the world to share their experiences on Flip Learning 3.0. Some of the topics we have lined up, how Flip Learning takes game-based learning from good to great, how Flip Learning makes teaching with augmented reality possible, how Flip Learning works with ELLs and takes that kind of training from good to great, and then finally, how flip learning takes project-based learning from good to great. Okay, you can watch good to great. You can watch for the uh, dates of each of these sessions by going to fllglobal.org forward slash webinars, and there you'll see the dates and times, and you can mark your calendar. Reminder, you can also learn about other flip learning training by going to fllglobal.org forward slash get certified. Finally, if you'd like to continue this discussion, you can go to fmglobal.org forward slash community. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us today. As always, we thank you for your contributions to Flip Learning. We look forward to connecting with you again very soon. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye.